together, side by side, Senator with Smith, these families. Um, the time for the debate has expired. Questions without notice, Senator Muriel Smith. <laughs> Order. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, when asked whether the Morrison government will commit to the Murray-Darling Basin plan in full and on time, Senator Rustin said, and I quote, there are many people who have made many comments, but that doesn't change the commitment of this government to remain absolutely focused on the delivery of the Murray-Darling Basin plan. Given your coalition colleagues have today sought to prevent all water buybacks and block the return of the 450 litres of water to our rivers, can the minister confirm not all members of the coalition share that commitment? Order. Before I call Senator Birmingham, on my right, I have asked repeatedly for silence during questions. There was murmuring across the chamber. I'd appreciate that not occur during questions. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, in this place, I speak. Uh, speak uh, representing the Prime Minister, representing the government. Uh, I don't pretend to speak uh, for every single individual and their views, but I make very clear in response to Senator Smith uh, that the government stands resolute in its support for the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, for implementation, as we have said, in full and on time. We are proud as a government to have ensured that billions, billions, thousands of billions of litres of additional water entitlement have been secured to support environmental flows across the Murray-Darling Basin. The securing of those thousands of billions of litres of additional water entitlement is enabling the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder to undertake a range of activities in support of environmental assets across the Murray-Darling Basin, not just in your home state and my home state of South Australia, Senator Smith but right across the Murray-Darling Basin in the support and protection of Ramsar wetlands, of internationally significant environmental assets and of the overall sustainability of the river system. But as has always been the case in relation to the Murray-Darling Basin, it is also crucial that the Basin Plan continues to be implemented in a way that seeks to ensure we not only have a sustainable river, but we have sustainable and productive river communities who rely upon it as well. Uh, and that has been something our government has sought to work hard to achieve over the years in terms of prioritising investment in infrastructure uh, across the river uh, to secure those further water entitlements uh, whilst helping those river communities to become more productive, to become more productive whilst returning water to the river, to maintain that production of food Order. and fibre that is essential to river economies whilst having that healthy river system. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. South Australian Liberal Water Minister David Spears has said, and I quote, I have spoken with Minister Pitt today to express my disappointment with this stunt by the National Party. The Marshall government categorically rejects the amendments put forward in the Senate. Does this minister reject the amendments from coalition senators? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. The answer to that is yes, uh, Senator. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is the case that when those amendments come to a vote, uh, I and the government will be voting uh, against those amendments. Uh, that is the government position, and Mr. President, uh, the Order. government does so. The Order government does so. Order, Senator Wong. Clear in our position, Senator as Wong. I said in the primary question, Senator Smith. Order, that Senator we Birmingham, support please the Murray resume Darling your Senator Birmingham, plan. please resume your seat again. Senator Watt, when I call senators by name, I expect them to heed it. I was calling senators on my left who were busy interjecting, Senator Wong. I expect them to heed it for at least a period. I don't want to have to shout to get the names through the wall of noise. Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, Mr President. Was it, was, it, was the coalition government, was the Howard government that passed the Water Act in 2007? I am pleased that throughout the time, my time in this place, indeed, around the time of the passage of the Water Act, it was one of the first bills that, uh, that I contributed to in this building, that we have maintained a bipartisan position in relation to support for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Order. It's my Order. intention that that is preserved and that is continued, uh, and that is why the government will continue to support the Basin Plan. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. 
Given the Nationals' demonstrated disdain for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, will the Prime Minister ensure the Nationals do not retain the water portfolio or control of the Morrison government's water policy? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, it's not for me to speculate in relation to ministerial arrangements, but I make clear, as I have, that the government's position in terms of support for the implementation of arrangements under the Water Act, including the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, remains. The government is determined to continue to support basin communities in the way in which that plan is implemented and to be mindful of the fact that there have been and are genuine concerns from people whose livelihoods and communities depend upon the basin and that we ought to be sympathetic and mindful of those concerns whilst ensuring implementation of a plan that guarantees all communities that rely upon the river system have a healthy and sustainable river system to support them, to support their communities, to support the productive growth of food and fibre uh, that our economies depend upon, particularly across those river communities, but to support also the healthy, uh, sustainable system into the future. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's technology not taxes approach to emissions reduction is helping Australia not only meet but exceed our international obligations while standing up for Australia and supporting our economy without costing Australian jobs, costing the Australian industry and threatening Australia's energy security? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Thank you very much, Senator Small. And yes, I can. The Morrison government is taking practical action to reduce emissions through technology, not taxes. And our plan is working. I know Labor and the Greens don't like to hear these facts, uh, but emissions are now at the lowest levels since records began in 1990, more than 20 per cent below 2005 levels, and we are reducing them at about double the rate of, our, of, of the average across the OECD and will absolutely meet and beat our 2030 Paris target. And to keep this momentum going, we will invest $20 billion in new energy technologies by 2030, unlocking some $80 billion of public and private investment over the decade. Now, our technology investment roadmap is about supporting a portfolio of technologies so we can reduce emissions across every sector of the economy, so we can create at least 160,000 jobs by 2030, so we can deliver the cheap and reliable energy Australians deserve, and so we can keep the lights on without sending jobs offshore, and so we can secure Australia's future. But just last night in, the, in this place, we saw firsthand the very real danger uh, that those opposite, Labor and the Greens, if they were ever back on the government benches, would provide. They voted against $192 million of investment in lower Order. emissions technology, significant reforms that would have seen even lower emissions and created thousands of new jobs. Even the member for Hunter described Labor's decision last night as ideological craziness. In fact, he has said that, sadly, the hard left, the excessive progressives, as I call them, are just on an ideological bed. Order. Now, Senator McAllister, we know you fit very much in that camp. The excessive progressives are in charge. It's all about dogma and ideology rather than the policies that work, bringing down emissions, growing jobs and securing our future. Order. Order. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline why this technology, not taxes, approach is important to supporting jobs in my home state of Western Australia, but is particularly important in reducing emissions in intensive industries like manufacturing, agriculture, transport and resources? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. And Senator Small is right. These sectors keep the Western Australian economy moving, and critical to supporting jobs in these sectors is supporting the technology that allows them to offset, offset or abate their emissions. Now, our changes to ARENA's mandate would have provided $192.5 million in new funding to back technologies like healthy soils, carbon capture and storage, and reduced emissions for aluminium and steel, energy efficiency and clean hydrogen. Now, one in ten West Australian jobs are in the mining industry. So this makes the development of carbon capture and storage technology vital for WA. Yet those opposite voted against it. Now I know that each way Elbow is heading for WA, 
He is heading to WA next week to hold a sh shadow cabinet meeting. This will be the test for him. Will he be honest with the people of WA and the Pilbara and outline his plan to tax his way to net zero emissions and the impacts of that on the WA and Australian economies? Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. And in light of the minister's answer about how effective our technology, not taxes, approach has been, uh, is the minister aware of any risks to our economy and Australian jobs whilst we set about lowering emissions? Order. Senator Seselja. Well, thank you. Um, well, we saw last night, didn't we, some of those risks. All those Labor senators, all those Labor senators Order. voting with their Greens coalition partners to block a technology-led approach to reducing emissions. Senator Watt. They voted against their own policy platform. Senator Thorpe. They voted to rip $192 million of new funding for arena programs that would create 1,400 jobs. When it comes to reducing emissions, if it's not technology, it has to be taxes, and they've shown which side they're on. You know, they've stolen Jeremy Corbyn's uh, slogan, uh, and they've stolen some of his high-taxing policies. So taxes are in Labor's DNA. They are absolutely reckless. They've abandoned the 2.2 million Australians working Order. in energy-intensive industries. They've sent a clear message to Western Australian families and families around Australia. Labor will always put politics above people and ideology over jobs. Order. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I refer to an article in the Australian Financial Review entitled Just 30 per cent of aged care staff vaccinated against COVID-19. The article goes on to state that this refers to at least a single dose. More than four months after the vaccine rollout started, how many aged care workers have been fully vaccinated with both shots against COVID-19. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and uh, the article in the Financial Review is a little out of date, Mr President. Uh, there are 33 per cent, or 85,272 uh, residential aged care staff who have received a first dose of a vaccination. Uh, according to the latest data that I have, Mr. President, and of those 85,272, 40,354, or 15.6 per cent, have received a second dose of their vaccination, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, um, uh, we continue to work cooperatively with the states and territories on the rollout of the vaccine, as uh, I've explained to the chamber before, and as the opposition. Uh, aren't honest enough to acknowledge the, the, we've Order. had to reset the rollout of the vaccine uh, to aged care workers on a couple of occasions based on health advice. Uh, yes, it was our initial intention, Mr. President, to vaccinate aged care workers alongside aged care residents, but we received health advice that that was not safe to do so. So we didn't. We heeded that health advice, Mr. President. Uh, so, so, so we, we then received advice, Mr. President, uh, that uh, with respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine, and we made some changes to the way the rollout was uh, occurring in in that context, Mr. President. So, we've opened up a number of channels to provide access for aged care workforce to uh, receive a vaccination. They can go to their GP, Mr. President. They can go to a Commonwealth vaccination clinic. They can. Uh, be su supported through uh, their provider, and quite a number of providers are actually providing their own vaccination services in-house as a part of a uh, request for tender that remains open for Order. aged care providers to operate. Mr. President, uh, they can go to a state vaccination clinic and have priority for that vaccination process. So we continue to work Order. Uh, cooperatively Corbett, to ensure aged the care workers have access has to vaccines. Expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. More than four months after the vaccine rollout started, how many home care workers have been fully vaccinated with both shots against COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, at this point in time, Mr. President, based on the data that I have, 18.3% uh, of uh, home care workers have received a vaccine, and of that 18%, 4.3% uh, of them. Uh, have had a uh, second dose, Mr. President. These are very early numbers because those numbers are being reported to us 
um, at this point in time voluntary, voluntarily, ver voluntarily uh, by home care providers. Uh, that process will be made uh, uh, compulsory uh, in coming weeks, Mr. President. Uh, so we continue to provide access to all of those who are providing support to senior Australians through the pr various processes that I mentioned to you in my answer to the previous question. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. The government's own aged care workforce task force re recommended in 2018 that a national registration system be implemented to track aged care staff working across multiple facilities. Can the minister confirm that this has still not been implemented, despite around 70 per cent of aged care workers remaining completely unprotected against COVID-19, and last year's COVID-19 outbreak in Victoria being sparked by aged care workers working Order. across Senator multiple Walsh. facilities? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, as a part of our response to the uh, Royal Commission report on aged care quality and safety, the government has announced a workforce registration program across all of the aged care system uh, as a part of the uh, as as a part of the uh, reforms that we announced in the budget, Mr. President. So uh, we have acknowledged that that's required, uh, and we are working to ensure that that actually is the case. It is an important thing for us to understand, Mr President. Uh, we've, we've order. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Yes, point of order direct relevance. We didn't ask about the announcement. We asked about the implementation. Um, you've reminded the minister of that part of the question. There was other parts after it, but it did all refer to that particular program. I, I don't believe I can rule a minister not being directly relevant when he's talking about the actual program. That goes to the content of the answer, which can be debated after question time. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we've we've uh, conducted a number of uh, processes and consultations with the aged care sector to uh, ensure that we have a system in place that uh, is effective and and has the attributes that we want, Mr. President. The Royal Commission made a recommendation with respect to uh, a certain form of registration process. Uh, we didn't accept that recommendation. We're going to utilise a system that currently exists so that we can get it up. Uh, and operational as quickly Order, as possible. Senator Colbeck. Senator Davey. Very much, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the Minister please outline what the Liberal and Nationals in government are doing to support more women into leadership positions and further close the gender pay gap that Labor is always worried about? including through initiatives in the women's budget statement. Order. Order. I will call the minister when there's silence. The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey uh, for her question. The improvement of women's economic security and supporting more women into leadership positions is a key priority for the Morrison government. The 2021-22 Women's Budget Statement includes a $38.3 million expansion, for example, of the successful Women's Leadership and Development Program, funding innovative projects across Australia that support women into leadership roles, including, as I know Senator Davey recognises the importance of, uh, in regional Australia. Mr President, in the Morrison-Joyce Cabinet, seven women hold cabinet positions, the highest number ever, Order. Mr President, uh, including three of my colleagues here in the Senate uh, sitting with me today. Four additional positions in the ministry or the assistant ministry are also held by women. Those cabinet and ministry members are all members of the Cabinet Task Force on Women's Safety and Economic Security. We're also supporting women's leadership in the public sector, including with a 50 per cent target for women on Australian government board positions, and we are on track to meet those commitments. Our women's budget statement also includes a $17 million investment to support world-class sporting events and development programs for women and girls in both football and basketball. We know that sport can be greatly beneficial to women's leadership for players, for administrators, for coaches and for volunteers. We warmly welcome the FIFA Women's World Cup coming to Australia and New Zealand in 2023. Order. Nepal World Cup. Across Order. Australia, I note importantly that the gender pay gap is at a record low level of 13.4 per cent. And we are committed to driving that even lower, Mr. President. 
I particularly want to welcome the leadership of the Director Order of the Workplace Gender left. Equality Agency, Mary Woolridge. She will play a key role uh, in that work in the coming months and years, and she is highly regarded uh, for her contribution in this area. Order. Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline the support that is provided through the Women's Leadership and Development Program that you just mentioned? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. Across Australia, over 60 organisations will receive support under the Women's Leadership and Development Program to deliver projects that improve women's leadership and development across five key areas. Job creation, economic security, workforce participation, leadership and safety. The program funds projects including Women Building Australia, run by the Master Builders Australia to support more women into building and construction. Then there's Titters in Business in Mango Hill in the Moreton Bay region, which supports Aboriginal women in urban, regional, rural and remote locations in starting their own businesses. The Tasmanian-based Brave Foundation, which builds support and acceptance around expecting and parenting teens as they seek employment. Mr President, I reviewed the, uh, the, the, the electorates across Australia in which uh, the WLDP program uh, is supporting, uh, supporting organisations like those I've already mentioned. It doesn't matter whether it's Bendigo or Durack, whether it's Order. Grey or Senator the Yari, right across Australia, we're supporting women's leadership. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please explain what our government is doing to promote women leaders through Australian government board positions and other key appointments. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, because Senator Davies' question is a very important and timely one. We know that gender diversity on boards, for example, contributes to more effective and innovative decision making and outcomes. Uh, in December of 2020, women held a record 49.5 per cent of Australian government board positions. We have strategies uh, in place to meet the target of 50 per cent, and I'm personally committed to continuing to increase gender diversity and to reach that target. As a coalition government, we've appointed a number of women to senior leadership positions, including the outgoing secretary of my own department, Frances Adamson. Secretary Adamson has done a, an exceptional job as the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I want to acknowledge her leadership, her own commitment to diversity, uh, what she has brought to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the change that she has overseen in the department over the 36 years of her role in DFAT is exceptional. I, attended her speech at the National Press Club today with Senator Birmingham, Senator Selger and Senator Wong to acknowledge that leadership. Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. While the Liberal and National parties are squabbling over net zero by 2050, global leaders are focused on the main game of re reducing pollution by 2030. This is the critical decade. If the Nationals agree to the Prime Minister's preference for net zero by 2050, won't that just confirm that delay is the new denial? The Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Um, well, I, I am slightly flabbergasted by, uh, by that question that seems to insinuate that the Greens, who I thought argued very strongly and passionately for commitments uh, to net zero by 2050, uh, now seem to be deviating from that position. Now seem to be saying they have an alternate position. Now, indeed, the Prime Minister has said he wants to see net zero achieved as soon as is possible. So, in that sense, Senator Waters, if, uh, if you're saying would before 2050 be preferable, well, indeed, if it's possible, if it's possible to be achieved in a world in which we get that delivered through the type of technology, not taxes, approach. Uh, that our government is outlining through the type of cooperation around the world that we are seeking to strive and achieve in relation to investment in those technologies that are necessary to reduce emissions. But in terms of the short term, Australia can hold its head high as being a nation who hasn't just made commitments in relation to emissions reductions, but has met those commitments and exceeded those commitments. And often we have done so in terms of meeting and exceeding those commitments in a way far clearer, far, far stronger than some of those countries that the Greens or others cite. You know, Australia is a country that beat its Kyoto-era targets by 459 million tonnes. 
Our emissions are down by over 20 per cent in the period from 2005 to the end of last year. 20 per cent down for Australia's emissions, and that compares with 6.6 per cent across the OECD average. That's a track record that shows Australia has been making change, and we've been able to do it and achieve it in a, as a country while still growing our economy through seeing growth and investment in technologies. That's precisely what our government is committed to continuing to pursue. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The coalition repealed the price on pollution before it was set to link to the European Union. Had you not done so, Australian farmers today could be earning $80 a tonne by storing carbon in the land. The coalition has already lost Australian farmers $1.4 billion of new export income and will cost another $11 Order. billion before the end of the Order. decade. Why are you and your coalition partners acting against the interests and profits of Australian farmers? I remind senators again that I need silence during questions, and there were interjections from both sides of the chamber during Senator Waters' question then. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. Well, indeed, this side of politics well and truly stands up for Australian farmers. We have made sure that we invest in the type of soil carbon capture in soil technologies that can help Australian farmers, can help to achieve reduction in emissions, but in achieving that reduction in emissions, do it in a way without applying taxes that could hit Australian farmers, Australian businesses, Australian industry and Australian households. What's obvious in Senator Waters' question just then is that the Australian Greens want to see a tax come back. The Australian Greens want to see a tax come back. And what was obvious from the voting record of the Greens last night is that they oppose investment in soil carbon. Apparently they oppose investment in hydrogen technologies as well. Mr President, I find this Order. astounding that the Australian Greens, having come into this chamber yesterday, along with the Labor Party, to vote against more investment in hydrogen technology, more investment in soil carbon, now come in here Order. and are asking Senator instead Birmingham, for us to go to a tax route. The answer has expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. With Japan, our biggest customer of coal and gas, lifting their 2030 ambition to 46 per cent, and South Korea, our third biggest customer, lifting theirs to 40 per cent yesterday, are you really going to give the climate-denying National Party the trade portfolio? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, Australia's 2030 targets will see our emissions per unit of GDP fall by some 70 per cent. Achieving our 2030 target will see emissions per capita fall by almost 50 per cent. That's the type of scale of activity that Australia is committed to and is taking and, based on our track record, will meet and exceed yet again. But under a coalition government, we'll meet and exceed it by investing in technology that helps farmers, like soil carbon, by investing in technology that helps energy regions of Australia, those whose jobs depend upon energy sectors, through investment in areas like hydrogen. And the actions taken by those opposite last night, so roundly criticised by Mr Fitzgibbon, as Senator Sajilja outlined before, the actions taken by those opposite don't help to get regions to transform to a hydrogen economy. They don't help farmers to transform in terms of use of soil carbon. All you've done is stand as a roadblock to the type of action you say should be occurring. And Order. you should all be ashamed Senator of the vote you cast. Senator McGrath. Hey. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Hey. The Beedaloo Basin has potentially enough gas to supply Australia's needs for decades offering the chance to grow a vibrant manufacturing industry in northern Australia while lowering carbon emissions. Can the minister inform the Senate what the Liberal Nationals government is doing to unlock the Beedaloo Basin's gas reserves to support our economic recovery while lowering emissions? The minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator McGrath, um, but particularly for his interest in the benefits that can be generated for northern Australia by the extraction of the amazing resources that exist in the northern part of our country. Um, and, and like uh, that, one of the very, very important projects is the, uh, the development, the gas development in, in the, the $224 million Beedaloo Strategic Plan. The plan will help to deliver on Australia's long-term gas supply Order. and dramatically improve our energy security. The Beedaloo Subbasin is one of the largest undeveloped resources of onshore gas anywhere in the world. 
Um, it's estimated that there's over 200,000 petajoules of shale gas in the sub-basin. And if you want to put that into some sort of context, that is uh, would amount to only 15 per cent of that amount would actually supply Eastern Australia their entire market for in excess of 15 years. So the sub-basin holds extraordinary potential for Australia uh, because of the quantities of oil it has in reserve. And under this particular program, we will be able to accelerate Order. a number of projects and to deliver approximately 10 exploration wells in the sub-basin in the next 12 months. The plan will bring in addition $150 million of additional private investment. Um, this plan is a plan to support Northern Australia, and it also enables us to deliver things like um, strategic road corridors, which will not only support 400 jobs but also uh, support the northern part of Australia. But we're also making sure that we deliver benefits for Indigenous owners and making sure that there are Indigenous jobs, Indigenous business and Indigenous opportunities. Gas is essential for our manufacturing sector, just as it is essential for our homes and to fire up our barbecues and for lowering emissions. And that's exactly what the Beetaloo Basin can do Order. for our nation. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Order at the rear of the chamber, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Rice. Senator McGrath. Can the minister outline more broadly how the development of gas is not only essential to supporting exports and domestic manufacturing, but also lowering emissions? Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, Australia's resource and energy sectors not only are leading when it comes uh, to developing new technologies, but we are also leaders in making sure that we adopt cleaner production processes. So this includes Australia's gas industry, which is well placed also to meet the demand, the growing demand in our Asia Pacific region. So the government is absolutely committed to supporting innovative producers by embracing technologies such as carbon capture, use and storage to deliver on our emissions reduction targets, which we are absolutely committed to. Um, and we will continue not only to have a responsible approach, but a pragmatic approach. Exactly. We are absolutely committed to technology and innovation being the backbone of the delivery of our energy future, and we are not going to tax the Australian economy out of existence on some ideological pretext. This government is absolutely committed to investing in things such as the carbon capture use Order. and storage Senator projects. Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate on how a technology, not taxes, approach, including adopting nuclear technology as mentioned in the government's technology investment roadmap, could assist in lowering Australia's carbon emissions while growing our economy? Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, our technology investment roadmap. Um, is absolutely designed to make sure that technology is the absolute core of everything we do going forward. So making sure that we, uh, we watch for technologies, international developments, to make sure that Australian households, Australian businesses, all Australians are able to exercise the choice so that they can avail themselves of latest technologies where it makes sense to do so. And it's only sensible to evaluate and deploy any technology that can bring down emissions but at the same time deliver affordable, reliable and dispatchable energy for all Australians. This is because, as I said, we are committed to a technology delivery into the future. We are not going to tax our way uh, to, a, uh, to a clean energy future. We are going to innovate our way there. And that is why we oppose those opposite in their attempts to try and destroy our technology facilitated Order. energy future. Order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General and concerns the government's failure to deliver on its 2019 election promise to legislate a National Integrity Commission. What is the Attorney's response to the open letter to the government from 59 eminent Australian jurists, including Mary Cauldron QC, former High Justice of the High Court, Tony Fitzgerald QC, former Federal Court Judge and Head of the Fitzgerald Inquiry, no less than 13 former State Supreme Court uh, ju justice, uh, court and, uh, and uh, Appeal Court Justices, and others including Nicholas Cowdery QC, former New South Wales 
uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, and Geoffrey Watson, SC, former counsel assisting in the New South Wales ICAC, saying, and I quote, Enough is enough. The establishment of a National Integrity Commission with teeth is long overdue. The government has kept the Australian public waiting for 922 days and has found time to tackle a great number of uh, the government's self-described priorities outside the coronavirus response, but has yet to find time uh, for this one. Order, Senator Patrick. Order. I'll call the minister when there's silence. The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for your question. And, uh, Mr. President, in the first instance, what I would say to Senator Patrick Order. is that I disagree with the premise of your question. Uh, the Morrison government is delivering on our commitment to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Uh, Mr. President, the government has already put in place Order. the funding required for when the Commonwealth Integrity Commission legislation is passed. Uh, Senator Patrick, you would be aware that in the 2019-20 budget, the government committed $106.7 million of new money to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. This was in addition to the $40.7 million Order. in funding for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, which will transfer to the Commission, and that is a total of $147.4 million. The government has already implemented phase one of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission by expanding the jurisdiction of the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity to cover four additional agencies, those agencies being the Australian Taxation Office, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority and the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Uh, you may also be aware that in the interim, the government has also allocated $54.4 million to support this year the expanded jurisdiction, which means that the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity staffing levels will increase from 64 to 110 ASL in the 2021-2022 financial year to support its expanded work. The Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, including resources and staffing, will be assumed by the Commonwealth Integrity Commission uh, once it commences. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, Madam Attorney, there are just seven sitting weeks of the Senate's rema remaining this year. That's uh, 28 sitting days. That's probably only nine gag motions from uh, Senator uh, Birmingham. Will Will the Attorney General uh, commit to introduce the Government's Integrity Commission Bill on the first day of sitting on 3 August for this important matter that, uh, that, that, such that it can be subject to uh, debate? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator Patrick, a nationwide consultation process on the legislation to establish the Commission has recently been completed. Uh, there were approximately 333 written submissions received and 46 Order. consultations, meetings and roundtables that occurred during the consultation period. Uh, the government will carefully consider the feedback received through this extensive Order. consultation process to inform further refinement of the draft legislation before it is introduced into the parliament. Uh, but I would note that it is important, uh, not only due to the scale of the reform, uh, but so that Australians can have confidence that the Commission will operate effectively. Uh, the purpose of the body, Senator Patrick, uh, is extremely serious, and as such, the government does need to consider uh, the feedback Order. that has Senator been provided Cash. to Time it for the through answer the consultation has expired. Process. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Ernie, isn't it the case that the government has delayed a federal ICAC for so long to ensure that the Commission will not be operational before the next federal election? Hasn't that been the government's plan all along? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you. And no, Senator Patrick, I completely reject. Uh, what you've stated in your question. I've already taken you through how the Morrison government is already delivering on its commitment to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. I have advised you that a nationwide consultation process 
uh, has just finalised. Uh, it had received over 333 written submissions. Uh, there were 46 consultations, meetings and roundtables that occurred during uh, the consultation period. Uh, I think you would agree, Senator Patrick, that this uh, significant legislation is a piece of legislation that we have to get right. Uh, it is important not only due to the scale of the reform, uh, but so that Australians can have confidence uh, that the Commission will operate effectively. And as I've said to you, uh, the government will consider carefully the feedback received through this extensive consultation process to inform further refinement of the draft legislation uh, before it's introduced into the parliament. Senator Gallagher. To the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. On Monday, the minister promised to provide the Senate with the government's document outlining how many vaccine doses will be provided across Australia month by month until the end of 2021, saying, and I quote, I am happy to provide that information to the chamber. I will come back to the chamber as soon as possible with that information. Why has the minister failed to provide the document to the Senate in line with his commitment and in direct contravention of yesterday's OPD, unanimously supported by the Senate, including by the government? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, it, it's actually not correct to say that I've refused to provide the data, Mr President, because my letter Order. to the Senate uh, yesterday says the final, da final data will be released once finalised by the Coordinator General over coming days. So, Mr President, there is a commitment from me and from the government to release the data. This data is the state's data. It's it's be, it's being managed. It, it is well, Mr. Mr. President. Um, as I said in my letter yesterday, the Coordinator General of the Vaccine Rollout, Lieutenant General JJ Fruin, is currently consulting with states and territories on the um, on the vaccine horizon information, including each jurisdiction's breakdown of allocated vaccines across horizon allocation periods to the end of 2021, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, my advice is that that information has been published uh, now on the um, uh, Inspector General's website, and I'll provide it to the chamber at the end of question time. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Lieutenant General Fruin told the, the COVID-19 Select Committee on Monday with respect to the vaccine information, I quote, I've also provided these documents directly to the states and territories. Given the Commonwealth provided its document to First Ministers, why has the minister claimed in his inadequate response to the Senate's OPD, quote, will be released once finalised, when the document requested by the Senate has already been handed over to the states? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, the evidence given on it to the committee on Monday night talked, um, uh, talked about the consultation with the states with respect to the release of the data. My letter to the Senate indicates that that process is being undertaken, has been undertaken. Uh, the data is now available. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary, final supplementary question. The Morrison government has broken its promise that all Australians would be fully vaccinated by October, 4 million would be vaccinated by the end of March, all of 1A would be vaccinated by Easter, and 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by the 10th of May. Is the government trying to keep this information secret, and will the government commit to the same information that was provided to National Cabinet on Monday being made publicly Order. available through Senator the Senate. Senator Gallagher. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as, as I've indicated to the Senate, the data is now available. Uh, I will bring the documentation to the chamber presented at the end of Order. question time, Mr President. Uh, uh, the information uh, is information that's been consulted on with the states to provide an indication of, it, of, the, of the vaccine availability out to the end of 2021. It is important information for the, uh, for the Australian people to understand, Mr President. Uh, and uh, had Mr President uh, Senator Gallagher listened to my previous answers, she would have understand, understood that the information is now available. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for South Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. 
Senator Colbeck. How is the Morrison government ensuring more older Australians receive the support they need in aged care? Order. Order. I'll call the minister when there's silence. The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question. Mr President, the Australian government is investing $272 million to support senior Australians to access the aged care services that they need. We will deliver uh, an investment in all services Australia centres around the country to provide general information per in person, face-to-face, -face, about aged care services available to them and assist people to use My Aged Care online channels from the October 31. New, the new face-to-face -face aged care specialist will be available in 70 service Australia centres in all states and territories and include mobile service centres to reach rural and regional areas. This service will help people with the end-to-end -end process of accessing aged care services, including financial, financial information support. We will also be linking up Services Australia and My Aged Care call centres so callers can easily be transferred between the two services. These simple but important measures are designed to make it easier for senior Australians to access the information they need to be in control and make their own choices as they age. Mr. President. We are investing $93 million to introduce a network of up to 500 local community care finders to improve engagement with vulnerable senior Australians, including people who are homeless. There will be $65 million to provide greater access to translating and interpreting services for culturally and linguistically diverse Australians. We have allocated $7 million to assist advocacy organisations provide better service, and this government Mr. President, remains committed to providing senior Australians with the care they need and deserve as they grow older. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise what other measures the government is implementing to support independent advocacy and greater choice for senior Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government's investment in aged care includes $94 million for expanded independent advocacy. This funding will more than double the aged care advocacy workforce to more than 150 advocates nationally, delivering around 15,000 more information and advocacy cases each year. This will improve access to face-to-face -face and virtual aged care advocacy for senior Australians in outer metropolitan, rural, regional and remote areas of Australia, as well as for home care recipients and culturally and linguistically diverse Australians. This investment will add also more than 1,000 local network and education sessions to build the capacity of older people, their families and representatives to exercise greater choice and control. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister outline the government's commitment to older Australians with our $17.7 billion record investment in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Australian gov government is delivering a once-in-a-generation change through our aged care reform package, the largest ever investment in aged care and the largest ever response to a Royal Commission. The government listened to the experiences of Australians who gave evidence to the Royal Commission and is taking decisive action to implement the recommendations with reforms to deliver vital services, improve quality care and viability in aged care, Mr. President. New home, package, home care packages have increased from 60,308 under Labor in 2012-13 to grow to more than 275,000 in 2024-25, an increase of 357 per cent. Residential aged care funding is $15 billion, up from $9.2 billion in 2013. Mr. President, every year under a coalition government, home care packages are up, residential care pla uh, places are up Order. and aged care Senator funding Colbeck. is up. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. I refer to reports that in yesterday's joint party room, chaired by newly re-elevated Deputy Prime Minister Joyce, 
that coalition senators Canavan and Rennick and MPs Mr Christensen and Mr Young spoke in opposition to the government's own childcare policy. Oh. With a proposal, with Senator Canavan making clear he would vote against this legislation, how many coalition members oppose the government's childcare policy? The minister representing the minister for education and youth, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I sincerely thank Senator Urquhart for that question. Allow me the opportunity to talk about our policy on childcare, because of course I am never, and I would never comment order. about Senator, deliberations Senator, within Senator Reynolds, the party please. room. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The minister's refusal to be directly relevant is apparent in that first response. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, order. Would you like her to speak, order. or do Senator, you want to Senator give? Senator Selger, please. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Senator Wong, please. Your point of order. Uh, the question went to. Oh, would, you like, would you like to finish? And... Yeah, you order, go right ahead. Senator, if we could stop. If, if, interjections, order. Interjections don't need to be made, and interjections don't need to be responded to. Order on my left and my right. Inter Senator Seselja, please. Se Senator Seselja, Senator Wong, points of order. Uh, to raise points of order, interjections should not be made. They should not be responded to. Senator Wong. Direct relevance. The question went to how many coalition members oppose the government's childcare policy. Um, Senator, Senator Birmingham, on the point of order. Mr. President, on, on the point of order, and you can tell there's a camera in the chamber today. Um, now, uh, now, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, this question from Senator Urquhart clearly went to matters that included the content of the government's childcare policy, and Senator Reynolds is entirely within orders to be responding in ways that address the content and the approach of those policies that Senator Urquhart was asking about. Okay, so if I could rule on the point of order. Um, Senator Wong, you reminded the minister of the conclusion of the question. The earlier the, order, the earlier part of the question um, asked the minister uh, about reports regarding a party room discussion um, that, in my view, did go to the content of policy. I'm not in a position to ever rule whether a minister is being directly relevant in eight seconds, in my view. Um, so I'll call the minister to continue. But to be directly relevant, in my view, the minister can go to the content of policy that um, may or may not or was reported to have been discussed in a coalition party room meeting, or to the second part of the question which you mentioned. It was quite broad in that sense. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And as I say, I, I will certainly not be talking about the confidential uh, deliberations of our party room, but I'm delighted to talk about the outcomes of that party room and the legislation that we bring into this chamber. So Order. Let, me, let me share with you some of the things we've been doing since in government. We're spending 77 per cent more than Labor did in government on childcare, a record $10.3 billion this year, including $9 billion to subsidise the fees set by childcare services. And today, over 280,000 Australian children are in childcare today. And wonderfully, women's workforce participation has reached a record high of 61.8 per cent in March of this year. Up from 58.7 per cent. We overhauled the childcare system in 2018 to introduce one subsidy. The hourly fee cap we introduced is working to keep downward pressure on fees, with 87.5 per cent of services charging under that hourly cap rate in centre-based daycare. But we know on this side of the chamber what really matters to parents. And that is their out-of-pocket costs. Order. We have kept Order. our out-of-pocket costs low. Order on Still my left. I'm having trouble hour, hearing the minister. One dollar an hour cheaper on average than before we introduced the package in 2018. Down from four dollars eighty-seven to three dollars ninety-three per hour. Order. And in this budget. We are providing an additional $1.7 billion to further help Australian families with more than one child five and under in those years where we know Order. they are Senator the toughest Reynolds, for working families for to Answer look after expired. their children. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. 
It is reported that one male MP angered some female members by suggesting working women who used childcare were outsourcing parenting. How many male coalition members think women are outsourcing parenting? Order, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator Urquhart for another opportunity to talk about the wonderful record this government has and how we understand the aspirations and the order, desire for order, Australian Senator parents. Order, Senator Reynolds, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, direct relevance. I mean, the minister's clumsiness is demonstrating what she's doing. She's saying, "I'm not even going to. I'm going to ignore that question. It gives me an opportunity to talk about our policy." No, uh, <laughs> I, I make the point again that, unlike uh, unlike the other place, I don't call ministers to order in my, from the chair myself. I wait for a point of order to be raised. This question was about uh, reports about a claimed statement and then asked, if I can read my own handwriting, how many, I believe, male members of the coalition uh, supported that statement. It's, it, it was the use of a reported phrase that is pejorative in nature. I'm going to give the minister some latitude. However, I will say I do not think this is as broad as the previous question and allow the opportunity to provide an explanation of policy that was prevented to the, presented or reported to be presented to the party room. So I call the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I reiterate my thanks to Senator Urquhart for this question, something which is at the heart of uh, passion uh, of uh, both parties and the coalition. And again, as we saw demonstrated in the party room yesterday, we did have a robust debate on an important policy issue to Australian families, and that is what Australians expect, and that is what marks the Order. difference between this side and that side of the chamber. Now, let me tell you what we did uh, discuss in relation to the legislation that is coming before the parliament. This is to provide an additional $1.7 billion to further help Australian families with more than one ch child, five and under, in the years that are the toughest for parents, for both parents to stay in the workforce. So what we did discuss is by increasing the subsidy for families with a second Order, or third Senator child, Reynolds, five and under. Order, Senator time for the answer has oh, expired. President. Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. It's reported that Senator Hughes responded to the revolt by saying that, and I quote, thank you, boys, for telling us how to best raise our children. Not all of us want to Order. sit at home with our three-month-old watching Bluey. Why are coalition members criticising women who work and trying to tell women how to raise their children. Order. Order. Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I say, I think we all love Bluey on this side of the chamber, a great Aussie classic. Order. Um, and I, again, I congratulate Senator Hughes uh, and everybody else who participates in the debate on this side because we discuss the issues that count to Australian families. Order. And as I started to say, Order. by increasing the subsidy for families, uh, 250,000 Australian families will be better off on average by $2,260 per year. And that is exactly what we discussed in the party room yesterday. We also discussed the issue where under this plan, a family on $110,000 with two children in full-time care will be $120 better off per week. And that, Mr. President, is what this side of politics is all about. It is providing choice and control of Australian Order. families and for women to stay connected with the workforce. Order on my left. Here, here. Order on my left. Order. Senator Reddick. Oh, okay. Right up. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. And, and can I add, I did stay home and raise my children for four years, and they were the happiest Order. days of my life as a stay-at-home parent. Okay, my question, Order. My, my question is for the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison's government economic plan is delivering new jobs across Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Rennick for what is a fantastic question to take us home on this Wednesday at Question Time. And in the first instance, I, can I actually acknowledge uh, Mayor David Good from the city of Gosnells in our home state of Western Australia for the Western Australian Senators. He is someone self-employed his entire life and someone who absolutely believes in the value of good economic policy. So great to see you here today, Mayor David Good. And Mr. President, the Morrison government's economic policies. Uh, they are seeing our economy rebound from what was a devastating 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, just last month in May, what we saw, because of the economic policies that we're putting in place, was the unemployment level in Australia fall now to 5.1 per cent. And again, that exceeded all market expectations. Mr President, this doesn't happen by accident. This happens because the businesses out there, the small businesses, the medium businesses, the large businesses, they are able to lever off the policies that the Morrison government puts in place to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs for Australians. And that is what we are now seeing. We now have around 130,000 more Australians in work than we did prior to when COVID-19 hit Australia. That is again showing that the Morrison government's economic policy is working. We also know that the recovery plan that we're putting in place, it is putting confidence uh, into Australians. We're putting up their hands and saying, I'm ready, willing and able to work. And what we saw again in the month of May was that the participation rate actually increased by point three points to 66.2 per cent. So what we're now seeing is unemployment is now down to the lowest level since 2014. Again, there's still more work to do, but certainly the policies that we are putting in place are having a positive effect on the economy. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Uh, how is the government's economic plan, including lower taxes, helping support Australia's economic reco recovery from COVID? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, when it comes to lower taxes, uh, that is just in the DNA on those on the coalition side of government. Because if you recall at the last election, colleagues, $387 billion in taxes was promised to the Australian people by the Labor Party. $387 billion in additional taxes was a promise made by the Labor Party to the Australian people at the last election. And all I can say is, thank goodness the Australian people put their trust and their faith in the coalition government. Because you see, then COVID-19 hit. Can you honestly imagine, colleagues, if those opposite had been elected to office and had then imposed an additional $387 billion in taxes on the Australian people. It would have absolutely crippled businesses across Australia, crippled small and family businesses in particular, and then they would have been hit with the COVID-19 pandemic. Lowering taxes, whether it's for business or for Australians, Order, it's in our Senator DNA. Cash. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. <laughs> sorry. How has the government's skilling and jobs agenda helped Australians Sorry, by supporting job creation to deliver economic opportunity? <laughs> Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government, we are all about opportunity for Australians. And again, that is reflected in the employment figures for the month of May, where we saw employment absolutely exceed the creation of market expectations. But of course, in uh, vocational education and training, uh, in the skills uh, part of the portfolio, we've provided an additional $2.7 billion to extend the boosting apprenticeship commencements. What we want to see is another 170,000 new apprentices and trainees brought on board to Australian businesses. We have extended that policy through now until March 2022. That's because we understand businesses out there, they do need our assistance, and this is a way of assisting them to bring a new apprentice, a new trainee on into their business. And encouragingly, we've actually seen since we first announced this policy, it's now 157,700 new apprentices, colleagues, have been brought on New apprentices, 157,700 have has been expired. brought on. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Yes, yeah. Senator Colbeck. COVID vaccination allocations horizons provided to state and territory health CEOs by the Coordinator General of the National COVID Vaccine Task Force on the 19th of June 2021. Senator Colbeck. 
Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Walsh and I. Oh, Senator Gallagher, sorry. Sorry, did you hear that? Yes. I, said, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Senator Walsh and myself. Uh, thank you. Uh, We've been asking for this information, which I understand the minister has just tabled at the end of uh, question time. Thank you. We've been after this information since uh, Monday, and the Senate actually passed an OPD um, to require the minister to table it, which was not followed. Uh, and then we've had a series of letters, and now it has been. It has been uh, tabled. Look, I would hope, and obviously we're going to have to take our time to read this, but I would hope that this information is the information that we were seeking and hasn't been modified by the government in any way at all. So we will take our time to have a look at that. I note um, our focus on the vaccine has been around the commitments the government has given and then failed to meet. So this is an important document to make sure that we are getting uh, the vaccine and the amount of vaccine uh, supplied, over, particularly over the winter months, to ensure that everybody who needs to be vaccinated should be vaccinated. We already know there are still people in Category 1A who remain unvaccinated. There are still people in Category 1B who remain unvaccinated because the Commonwealth has failed to roll out this vaccine program efficiently and effectively. I have no idea why they decided to hold so much back and ensure that they, they were responsible for rolling it out, because it's clear that the states and territories have the infrastructure and the ability to roll out the vaccine in a much more efficient way than the Commonwealth has been proven to be. And this has meant that particularly vulnerable groups, uh, people who live in residential aged care, people who receive home care packages, people in disability group homes, those staff that work in those homes, the families of those who visit people who live in those homes, are now exposed to much more significant risk from the outbreaks that will invariably come uh, across the country because of a number of failures, not just the vaccine, but the failure to put in place a national quarantine system that allows uh, returning or travelling Australians to quarantine safely and not pass the virus on. And we've had a number of, of breakouts from uh, quarantine. But our concern has been the failure of the Commonwealth to meet its own targets. Remember, these are not targets that anyone set but the government itself. So the government went out and said, we will vaccinate 4 million by the end of March. We will vaccinate all Australians, fully vaccinate it was, two shots by the end of October. We will do residential aged care and the workers who work in it in six weeks by Easter. And that there will be 6 million Australians vaccinated by early May. None of that have been met, none of it. None of those targets the government set itself have been met. And now they've brought in uh, military leadership, essentially, to take the responsibility away from the Department of Health. Um, the Department of Health, in a pandemic, who have been guiding this, have basically been told to stand aside and let the general uh, Fruin take over, which clear even strategic communications. So we've seen a, a very diminished role for health, all because the Commonwealth failed to plan and failed to execute a rollout strategy that kept Australians safe, particularly vulnerable Australians, older Australians, Australians living in aged care, workers <coughs> in those sectors, people over the age of 50. They know all the data overseas from serious outbreaks shows that these are the groups that need to be protected. And this is the vulnerability we face going into winter. The hospitals in Australia are already full. They're full and they're not even at their busiest point in time yet. I think hospital activity peaks in September. We can only hope that as many people roll up their sleeves and get this vaccine as can be done in the next three months, we must hope that the government numbers, if they are to be believed, actually do get supplied to the states and territories so that they can run the program and that we reduce some of the risk that Australians face going into this winter period. I imagine for many Australians this is an extremely scary time for them. 
hoping not to catch COVID, hoping to be get safe and hoping to get a vaccine. And these are important numbers. I hope the government has released everything that they've provided to the states and territories. We'll be looking at these closely because transparency is key to holding you to account to deliver for Australians when it comes to the vaccine rollout. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, um, Deputy President. Um, after 20 odd years in the military, one thing I have learned uh, is that the old saying that no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy is true. Um, you can plan, you make your plan on the basis of your analysis of the situation and assumptions, but when facts change, someone who is going to win the battle is the person who is prepared to be flexible, use the basis of that planning uh, as the basis for new plans to respond to situations. And so it is globally, as we look at the changing situation with COVID, that the very best laid plans will have to change as the facts change on the ground. And so with ATAGI being the independent expert group in Australia who advises the government and national cabinet, so governments of our states and territories as well, about uh, the efficacy of vaccines, that those considerations coupled with supply considerations that at times are outside the control of the Australian government. So we look at some of the well-advertised situations where uh, supply has been limited in terms of exports from Europe and other places. Uh, those are factors that will impact on a plan and a good military, a good government, a good deliverer of an outcome in what is a global pandemic uh, not seen for 100 years, is one that can adapt to the circumstances and the facts as they arise, as opposed to sticking rigidly with a plan, or in fact being unwilling or afraid to articulate a plan up front, that the whole concept of delivery is looking at the circumstances, making a plan on the information available, and then using that information to adapt and move forward. And so the information that is considered by National Cabinet includes those supply constraints, includes the information from ATAGI about effectiveness, uh, and then provides the best available information to people who are delivering services in the interests of the Australian people. So the Coordinator General of Operation COVID Shield, who is Lieutenant General Fruin, uh, and part of the reason I believe that the military do play a critical role in times of national disasters like floods and fires and pandemics is because they are good at planning and adapting and delivering. And General Fruin uh, has updated the planning projections for Pfizer and AstraZeneca doses for <coughs> the jurisdictions for the remainder of 2021. Uh, and as delivered, that information is valid. But the reality of life is it may change. And rather than complain about the fact that the facts have changed, what is important is that people know how to adapt and optimise available resource. But what General Fruin has indicated is that the Commonwealth is fast-tracking plans to expand the number of access points for Pfizer. By the end of July, all 136 Commonwealth vaccination clinics and around 1,300 GPs will be administering Pfizer, and many more primary care providers will be offered the chance to administer the mRNA vaccines as the supply of Pfizer significantly increases and the first supplies of Moderna arrive in September and October. So General Fruin was able to indicate that with the adaptation that has occurred, using that basis of planning to respond to the new facts on the ground, Australia is still on track with the expected supply picture to offer every eligible person in Australia a first dose of COVID by the end of 2021. First dose of a COVID vaccine, I should say. So it's important to understand that. It's also important to understand that many vaccines have actually already been delivered. Uh, a record Monday for vaccines. Last Monday, uh, we had 63,000. Uh, 119,000. These are the kind of figures we're now getting, 
And 128,000 on this most recent Monday shows that Australians are taking up the vaccine. Uh, and that's a really important thing because it now means that more than 65 per cent of over 70s are protected, more than 45 per cent of over 50s are protected, and more than one in four of the eligible population over 16 are protected. So facts will change, but good planning means you can adapt to the new facts and continue to deliver the outcome that Australians Senator need. Senator Fawcett, your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. And, and I do really want to believe Senator Fawcett and perhaps if he was the Minister for Health and he was, a, he was managing the portfolio instead of the hapless Minister Colbeck, uh, Australians might indeed have some degree of confidence. But what we've seen today in question time in answers to questions from my colleagues Senator Walsh and Senator Gallagher is once again this pattern of game playing, game playing with information that is about a game with people's lives. And we saw the game playing from this government and the false premises on which they proceeded and their failures to deliver and implement proper processes to protect Australians cost hundreds of lives in Victoria. And as I stand and speak here as a senator for New South Wales, our state is going into another very challenging period. Potential lockdown certainly changes to our practices because this virus remains. And Senator Colbeck gave answers to questions this, in his uh, response to those from, uh, offered from Senator Walsh, where he seemed to be very proud of these figures. 33 per cent of aged care workers have had their first dose. Better than zero, but it's a long, long way from where it needs to be. And it's a huge distance from where this government promised Australians they would be. Only 15 per cent of the people who are working in aged care across Australia have had their second dose. Now, I can only hope in New South Wales that the Delta variant, which is out in our community and causing so much concern, doesn't end up with an aged care worker in an aged care setting, or we're in all sorts of problems. And the reason that we're in this situation is because this government isn't telling the truth. It isn't telling the truth to the Australian people. It isn't coming here and telling the truth, and it isn't doing the work that needs to be done to provide the necessary protection for the Australian peoples. If you've got somebody going to a home, to a home of someone you love, a home care worker, you want to be really hoping in Sydney that on the watch of this government, who are responsible for rolling out the vaccine to home care workers and aged care workers, that that delta doesn't get into your home care situation, because only 4.3 per cent have had their second dose of all the home care workers. That's the bit of the job that this government was supposed to do. This is the bit of the job that the government stands up and says, yes, we're responsible for that. We're responsible for aged care. And they promised, they promised they would do this job properly, but they didn't. In response to a question from his own side today, Minister Colbeck pretended once again that they've accepted the Aged Care Commission uh, recommendations. But that is at odds with what he said in response to the question from Senator Walsh, because when she asked what was going on with the registration of people who are working across multiple sites, he had to tell the truth. And the truth is the government rejected that recommendation to set up a system to monitor who is working where, just like they didn't know who was vaccinated amongst the aged care workers. They've got no idea about how many people are working across what sites. And then he sort of faffed on for ages trying to pretend that they've got some system in place. It is required, he said, we are doing consultations. We're going to use, notice the future tense, not even the present tense and certainly not the past tense. They have not established anything. We are going to use, he says, a system already in place to get that up and running. Well, there is an absolute failure of responsibility. The government had one major job this year, and that was to effectively roll out the vaccine. It had a particular responsibility in the aged care sector. They have failed, and it's cost lives. 
I fear that the complacency of this government, who thinks it wasn't a race against this deadly disease, is going to cost more lives, especially with the Delta strain out and active. We lag behind countries like Fiji, Azerbaijan, Panama, just to name a few. They've got better vaccination rates than Australia. This is hurting our economy, it's hurting our families, it's hurting our aged care. It's time the government did their job and told the truth. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Once more, we rise to speak on uh, the vaccination rollout in this place, and once again, we have those opposite attempting uh, to play politics, which what is a very complex, a very important, uh, a multi-jurisdictional rollout of vaccinations across Australia using different varieties of vaccines in an, environment, in an environment where the health advice has changed a number of times. And that is exactly what those opposite do not want to talk about. The health advice has changed to a significant degree on a number of occasions, including uh, just last week when, uh, once again, the the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, was, was changed in terms of its, recommend, its age recommendation for Australians. I was booked in. I've said this in this place before. I was booked in for the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. I'd, I'd chosen to do it at the start of our winter recess. So uh, if there was any uh, potential uh, side effects, I'm not worried about an adverse reaction, but if there are any potential side effects, I wouldn't be uh, travelling to Canberra uh, in the imminent near future. Um, now, as a result of the changed health recommendation, that has uh, since been changed to a Pfizer vaccine, and that's going to be slightly later. Obviously, when the health advice changes, the rollout is going to change. And those opposite playing politics on this, uh, it's not only unhelpful, but it does play into the hands of those who wish to raise doubt about the vaccine efficacy. And I think those opposite should take that into account when they do play these political games. Now, obviously, when Atagi came to, um, to the government uh, and changed their recommendation on AstraZeneca, so that it was now recommended only for people aged 60 and over, uh, things needed to change. The experts at Atagi have made it clear that for those Australians who have had their first dose of AstraZeneca, it is strongly recommended that they do have their second dose of AstraZeneca, given the risks from the second shot of the vaccine are much, much smaller. Now, on receiving the advice for the change of age, uh, the government acted quickly, very quickly. Within half an hour, in fact, of receiving that advice, the government announced it publicly, and then uh, obviously that has flowed on through uh, the various jurisdictions to ensure that um, changes are made to the vaccine rollout and people are informed if their particular circumstances, as mine did, changed. Um, now, obvi obviously, there are other outcomes from the National Cabinet meeting. The Coordinator General of Operation COVID Shield, Lieutenant General Fruant, provided each state and territory government with planning projections of Pfizer and AstraZeneca doses for their jurisdiction over the remainder of 2021. Obviously, this allows the state jurisdictions to plan their individual rollouts. The Coordinator General confirmed the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine allocations are provided on a proportional population basis. The Coordinator General confirmed that the Commonwealth delivers all first dose allocations to states and territories with matching second dose allocations delivered three weeks after first doses are administered. Of course, this is important. This ensures that states and territories have control over allocation of first and second dose administration based on their supply schedules. Uh, National Cabinet also noted that the Commonwealth is fast-tracking plans to expand the number of access points for Pfizer. By the end of July, all 136 Commonwealth vaccination clinics, 40 ACCHSs and 1,300 GPs uh, will be administering Pfizer. Many more primary care providers will be offered a chance to administer mRNA vaccines as the supply of Pfizer significantly increases and the first supplies of Moderna arrive in September and October. 
The Coordinator General also confirmed that based on expect, expected supplies, Australia remains on track to offer every eligible person in Australia a first dose of COVID-19 vaccine by the end of 2021. Once again, the government's and my message to all Australians is make sure you are booked in for your first shot, make sure you are vaccinated. That is the best way to protect our loved ones, protect our community and return to normal in this pandemic. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This is, uh, I think, the third time in recent weeks which I've taken note on similar topics around the rollout of vaccines in aged care and response this time to questions from Senators Walsh and Gallagher. And it's frustrating me, it's frustrating me that I'm doing that and it's a sign that we still have so many unanswered questions on our side about what's happening with the vaccination rollout, about what's happening in aged care and about how it impacts residents in aged care and workers in aged care. The government has two jobs, two jobs when it comes to this pandemic. Quarantine and the vaccination rollout. And on both jobs, we are just seeing failure after failure, delay after delay, and excuse after excuse. Today in question time, we saw Senator Colbeck again try and blame the states for a failure to provide data in time, at the certain time, as was requested by the Senate. And it's not the first time he's blamed the states and territories for his errors, for his failures, for the failures of the Morrison government when it comes to the vaccine rollout, when it comes to quarantine. And the impact of this is very, very serious. The impact of this, just look at New South Wales. Just look at what's happening in New South Wales. And I echo Senator O'Neill's comments and concerns around what's happening in New South Wales at the moment. People are scared, people are worried, particularly the families of those who are in residential aged care, the workers who want to keep the residents they care for safe, in-home care workers as well, workers in our disability sector. This is dangerous. It's dangerous and because the government is botching it, people are feeling more scared than they should have to. We've heard today only 15.6% of residential aged care workers have received their second dose, meaning only 15.6% of residential aged care workers are fully vaccinated. 15%. Well, this is the front line. We saw what happened in 2020 in aged care. Australians watched in absolute horror as COVID rampaged through aged care homes in Victoria especially, where over 600 Australians died. They were horrific, horrific scenes which shook all of us, which shook all of us. And the lessons learned, the lessons learned should be that we cannot wait, we cannot delay, this is a race. The Prime Minister says, the Prime Minister says it is not a race, but it is a race. It's a race and Australians want it to be happening quicker, happening faster and happening effectively. They want the implementation going better. And we ask questions about the numbers, we ask questions about the data over and over and over again because this matters. Because how can you possibly track the implementation of something so important if you can't even answer basic questions about who's had the jab and who hasn't. If you can't even have basic delineations between what you're responsible for and what the states and territories are responsible for, and you can't even come into this place and say, yeah, I cop that, my bad, I've made a mistake, I'm going to take responsibility now. Australians are worried that on your two jobs, quarantine, vaccination rollout, you're failing and it's costing them. It's costing our country, it's costing our future, it's gonna impact how we come through this pandemic, without a doubt, without a doubt. And Australians are right to be, be worried. 
Now I, I join Senator Brockman in my absolute support for making sure that we take these vaccinations. As soon as I'm eligible, I will be getting vaccinated and I, I really look forward to the opportunity to do that. More Australians want to be vaccinated, but we need to get this rollout right so that they can be. And we need to get this rollout right so that the people who are most vulnerable in this pandemic, those in our aged care homes, those working there in disability care also, are safe, can keep those around them safe. That's what Australians want, but they need the government to step up to the plate on their jobs. The question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move to take note of the answers given uh, to my questions to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, um, Senator Birmingham. Now, I asked about climate ambition, and I asked why all of the fuss squabbling over 2050, whether it's preferably or not, between um, this Liberal government and their coalition partners in the National Party, when all of the science says that that is a distraction, it is an excuse for inaction, and that delay is the new denial. 2030 is the year that we should all be talking about. That's what the science says needs to happen. That's what most of the world is talking about. The G7 just made recommendations last week about taking serious action in this coming decade, including phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and including, importantly, seriously increasing participant countries' 2030 targets. Many of them were doubled. Our government didn't double its pathetic 2030 targets, and of course the opposition doesn't even have any 2030 targets. So this whole phony war between the Liberals and the Nationals as they squabble over what the new division of ministerial responsibilities are going to be with their new leader at the helm um, is a massive distraction and is really letting down anyone that cares deeply about delivering a safe climate um, for existing humans and future generations, and who cares about creating a prosperous economy with all of those jobs that will flow from a clean economy. Now, naturally, I didn't get um, uh, an answer to that question. I certainly got a whole lot of words, but Ed, I don't think you could describe them as an actual answer to that question of the fact that 2050 is uh, uh, talk of delay is the new denial. So I then asked about the impact on farmers of the repeal of the carbon price. This government loved to champion that um, they repealed the carbon price, but actually we've had the numbers crunched. And if, um, because as people would know, the carbon price was set to link to the EU scheme before it was appealed. If it hadn't have been repealed, our Australian farmers would be bringing in an absolute mozza. And the figures, to be more specific, are they could be earning $80 a tonne in today's prices by storing carbon on the land. So the coalition has already lost Australian farmers $1.4 billion of export income by um, getting rid of the price on pollution, um, and it's going to cost them another $11 billion by the end of the decade. So again, this nonsense from the National Party, who used to claim to represent farmers but now clearly just prioritise the interests of coal and gas companies over everybody else, um, and you know, there's no denying that anymore, uh, they claim that they once represented the interests of farmers, but actually they are denying Australian farmers the opportunity for an additional revenue stream. Um, and their continued denial and inaction on the climate is actually imperilling um, farmers' ability to keep producing food and fibre for us and the rest of the world. Um, I, I, do, I don't understand how you can still have climate denial uh, in the Chamber of Parliament in 2021, um, particularly not from a party that actually like often lives in rural and regional Australia, and where many farming groups keep saying to them, we can see the impacts of the climate crisis on our land, on our productivity. We want something done, and we want that option to be paid from sequestering carbon on our land. I don't understand why the National Party in particular, but uh, the, the governing Liberal Party, aren't listening to the people that they purport to represent. Um, again, I didn't get a real answer to that question. Um, it was the usual sort of talking point um, stuff and a whole lot of new slogans that obviously the focus groups have said you know, really work, but rural and regional Australians are not going to be duped by this assemblage of word salad 
They want action on the climate crisis. They can see what it's, ha what, what it's doing to their farms already, and they can see the opportunities um, for international carbon markets. But they're not getting the representation from the Liberal and National Party. Um, the last point that I made was whilst this squabble is happening about who's going to be in charge of what ministry under this new um, leadership of, of Barnaby Joyce, most of our trading partners are taking serious action and making serious commitments to increase their carbon pollution reduction targets. Japan um, have announced that by 2030 they want a 46 per cent reduction, and South Korea, who is our third biggest um, energy customer, have just yesterday lifted their targets to 40 per cent. So it's rumoured, of course, that the trade portfolio might go to the Nats as some kind of deal um, in making them go quiet on 2050. Well, do you really want climate deniers holding the trade portfolio when our closest energy trading partners are taking this issue seriously and are increasing their 2030 targets? It's not a game, folks. This isn't just sloganeering and, and power-mongering. This is um, the world's climate. This is agricultural productivity. This is the future of the reef. This is the safety of our nation's health. There is so much at stake here. For this issue to continue to be politicised um, is just absolutely woeful. Question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to.